Lifting weights will not bring your muscle back. You need to do cardio. Tell me, are you jogging? From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, Starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. We're happy to have you with us this Friday afternoon. And uh, Friday morning, depending on where you're looking at this uh, or listening to it, I think we don't we do uh, audio. Yeah. On uh, an audio release, this podcast. Yeah. I, I'm I'm just a complete dumbass. I don't actually know what's going on. <laughs> Nobody tells me anything. But I think we release this on where on Audible. Audible, I think. ITunes. And iTunes and where else? Some other place where it's only the audio. Yeah. And then. Uh, YouTube is the video mm-hmm. where you want to watch if you if you in fact want to watch which is way more interesting it's it's more interesting to watch I think you get to watch my hand twitch you know <laughs> your lobster claw my lobster claw <laughs> twitch like it is right now for I can't even stop that you know it's it's involuntary <laughs> can't stop it sometimes this hand tries to It's a problem sometimes, having all this involuntary shit going on. All right, now let's begin with our normal beginning segment that we always begin with, and it's comments from from the the haters. haters. And this week we only have one. Rip, are you really a cannibal? I mentioned something about cannibalism a couple of weeks ago in terms of how to solve the homeless problem in San Francisco and Los Angeles. Let's just use them as protein. So this guy wants to know if I'm really a cannibal. Well, yeah. Aren't you? You you may be a cannibal and, and not know it, Right? I think if you've eaten at Taco Bell, <laughs> you're a cannibal one way or another. And that's comments, comments from, from the, the haters. haters. Now, now that that silly bullshit is over with, we're going to uh, talk this week about uh, a favorite topic of ours, uh, something we have to deal with professionally essentially every day. All effective strength and conditioning coaches must deal with shit doctors say. All right. Now, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of shit doctors say today, but I want to go ahead and, and disclaim this thing. Uh, first by saying that not all doctors say this stupid shit because not all doctors are stupid, but lots and lots of them are. And you know this from personal experience, don't you? You know the doctors say stupid shit. And we're just going to talk about the stupid shit they say today. We're going to talk about the misconceptions that doctors have laid on very, very heavily in the mind of the general population. And we're going to talk about why they say these things. Uh, but first, we're going, to, we're going to talk about some of the more common things that doctors say. See my new shirt? Boys, Phoenix Ammunition gave me this shirt, and I thought I'd wear it today. Nice guys. Follow the show. Follow the program, load excellent ammunition. Give them a give them a look on the internet. Phoenix ammunition. That was free, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
And there are a few things the doctors say that you've all heard. You've either been told them yourself after an injury, or you've got somebody you know closely who's been told this after an injury. And we're just going to go down the list here and talk about the problems with each one of these things. All right. And what all of these things have in common is the fact that when doctors tell you these things, they have no idea what they're talking about. But that doesn't stop them from saying them anyway. And this is kind of a problem. Like the tried and true, don't lift more than 10 pounds. Right? You go in with any kind of a any kind of pain in your body, a doctor will tell you, don't lift more than 10 pounds. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know where the figure came from. Do you know what a bag of groceries weighs? What, what's a bag of groceries? 12, 15 pounds? You know, what are you supposed to do? Hire it done? You're supposed to hire done your 15 pounds bag of groceries? Hire your shopping done? Uh, don't lift more than 10 pounds is an incredibly nonspecific recommendation that, that really doesn't bear any resemblance to good advice about anything. Uh, lifting it can be done lots and lots of different ways. If you pick 10 pounds up off of the counter there at the checkout stand at the, in the grocery department and set it back in your basket and then walk it out to the car and pick that basket of that, that bag of groceries, 12, 15 pound bag of groceries up and put it in the trunk of your car or in the front seat or wherever you're going to put it, it would take a seriously frail individual to risk injury from picking that up. And an individual that frail is not going to the store anyway. You know why? Because she's in a rest home. So 10 pounds, I don't know what they think 10 pounds is going to do to you that's going to disrupt your physical existence. I'm, I'm not sure. It's just one of these things they say that doesn't make any sense. I wonder how they came up with that number. <clears throat> I don't know. That's, that's the problem with it. It's a round number. <clears throat> don't lift more than 10 pounds. 9 pounds is okay. 11 pounds will kill you. Yeah. Uh, this is obviously the first thing that occurred to anybody when they heard this ridiculous <laughs> nonsense come out of the mouth of this this medical professional nine pounds is okay but 11 pounds is not yeah just 10 pounds don't lift more than 10 pounds you don't need to lift more than 10 pounds what's your kid weigh if you got kids can't pick your kid up you know what are you what are you talking about uh th this is typical of the of the kinds of things they say uh, it indicates a complete absence of having considered the ramifications of that advice. And, uh, and every time, here's the interesting thing, every time they say something stupid like this, they undermine their own credibility. And it hadn't occurred to them that that's the case. And what they'll encourage you to do if you go into the doctor's office and you're uh, engaged in any kind of an exercise program, young guy goes in, you know, in his 20s and his foot hurts or something like that. Uh, the doctor will say, you know, you're, you're just lifting too much weight. Why don't you just lift lighter weight and do more repetitions? And that'll, that, that does the same thing. Lighter weight and higher reps does the same thing is heavier weight and lower reps. See, now this would be the same thing 
as somebody coming into my gym and me giving them advice about brain surgery. You know, Rip, I've got this, I've got these headaches. You know, I, I just, I can't, uh, I can't, uh, I can't make them go away. I've tried everything. I've tried ibuprofen, tried Tylenol, you know, and I say, well, you know, the answer is obvious. What you need to do is get your wife to go out in the garage and get your cordless electric drill. And then you put a three eighths inch drill bit in this electric drill motor and have her drill a hole in your skull in in the approximate position that you feel the pain because obviously it's pressure you just need to let that pressure out same thing right uh <laughs> lighter weight and higher reps is the same as heavy weight and lower reps or when they tell athletes you know lifting weights just slows you down lifting weights slows you down Makes you all muscle bound. Muscle binding is such a problem. It was a bigger problem back in 1955 than it is now, though. I, I mean, you don't ever hear muscle bound anymore, but that's what he's saying. He's saying that a stronger muscle uh, doesn't contract as fast as a as a weaker muscle. That's what he's saying. And uh, I, he may actually believe that. Uh, it's amazing. Oh, and then they get real specific. They don't want you to squat below parallel because that's bad for the knees, right? Uh, they don't want you to press overhead because that's bad for the shoulders. Causes shoulder impingement, you know. Oh, yeah, everybody knows that. Causes shoulder impingement. Every time you pick your hand up over your head, why it impinges your shoulder. Because your shoulders, after all, are that badly designed. Right? Why everybody that's ever pushed anything up over their head is impinged their shoulders. And, uh, you know, it's just, I don't, I don't know why you need to push anything up over your head anyway i mean if your house is correctly designed all your cabinets are at eye level right everything in the house is at eye level everything at work you do is not above the level of your your eyes so why do you you know i mean if you've designed your life correctly around the obvious anatomical limitations of your shoulders, you're not pushing anything up over your head anyway. So why do it in the gym? Don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Just lift light weights for high reps. You know, because heavy weights slow you down. Right? Oh, these these things get so so repetitive and boring. But uh but once again, uh their evidence uh of a man or a woman who is perfectly confident in saying things that they have just recently jerked out of their asses and presented to you as though they're true. And with absolute conviction in the analytical processes that resulted in this this wonderful advice they're giving. Uh, or the classic, you'll never walk again, right? Uh, oh, God, how many times have you heard that? You know, the doctor said, I'll never walk again. He said, I'll never walk again. So it would be wrong for me to try. And that's the net effect of that. That's so aggravating. God damn. Our friend Brian Jones falls off of a house. Falls off a two-story house. He's an insurance adjuster. He's up on a ladder. He's up on the roof. Something happens 
dumbass falls off the house and lands in a standing upright position with his knees locked and shatters both of his ankles. Pylon fractures, both ankles, just, you know, little chips of bone and flesh ground up in these in his lower legs. And uh, I mean, he's a he's a big man, and uh, you know he's got a wife, and kids, and he's proud of his self reliance. And uh, this is several years ago. In fact, it's on our website. The video is called "Recovery uh, Via Barbell Training" with Brian Jones. And uh, you need to look at this. You need to look at this video. Uh, here is a guy who was told literally he would never walk again. He they had him in a wheelchair. They had fixation devices on both ankles. This is a bad injury. This is a terribly bad injury. And he just didn't feel like playing this ridiculous game. And he was intelligent enough to understand the thing that doctors seem not to understand, which is stress, recovery, adaptation. Wherever you are right now, Wherever you are, you can apply a stress to the system that will result in adaptation if the stress is recoverable and if you do what's necessary to recover from the stress. This is the basis of training. And Ryan applied this obvious process to his own situation. And he started off not being able to walk. Of course, it's a terrible, dis de terribly destructive, invasive injury that he suffered. And uh, slowly, you know, he the, the, the process would be described as sitting, then crawling, and then walking, then standing, and then walking, and then deadlifting and squatting. And, you know, three or four years ago, Brian deadlifted 600 at a meet, having been told that he would never walk Again, I understand that a lot of that is covering your ass on the part of the doctor. If he tells you, you never, you will never walk again and you never walk again, then he was right. Right. And everything that happens better than that is no skin off his nose. So that's the, that's the, that's the reason for these pessimistic predictions. You'll never walk again. You'll never throw a baseball again. You'll never blah, blah again, right? And then if you do, it's great. It's a miracle. It's, it's, it's an absolute miracle. We have no medical explanation for this. Well, of course you don't because it's not medical. It is biological. And you guys didn't have enough biology in school to have absorbed the stress recovery adaptation thing, right? So if there's no downside to being pessimistic, then that's what we need to be is pessimistic. Shoot for a low goal. But there is a downside to it. There's a terrible downside to this. If you, with your silly ass advice and prediction, prognostication that this guy's never going to walk again, if he is stupid enough to believe you then you have discouraged him from trying, and he never enters the stress recovery adaptation process, and he never gets any better because you've imposed a limitation on a person with a, a less than concrete constitution. All right? Brian didn't want to hear any of that shit, and he knew that he could push himself and he could tolerate some pain in the process, and that in the process of pushing himself, he got better. So he's better than lots and lots and lots and lots of people, right? But when a doctor tells you you'll never fill in the blank again, um, that is so seldom true that it should be immediately disregarded, okay? Now, once again, not all doctors are this fucking stupid, all right? They're not this dense. Not all of them are this way. But lots and lots and lots and lots of them are. 
okay? And it is your job as a functioning human being to disregard the dumb things they're telling you, especially if they run counter to your own experience. And lots of these things do, right? The never walk again thing. That's, you all know that that's not true. All of you know people who've been told, who've been handed these limitations by doctors and uh, disregarded them and were better for it. How about the, my doctor recently released me to full activity. This is a, this is a offshoot of this never walk again thing, right? The doctor has released you to do what you want to do, all right? He's released you. But up until that release, who did you belong to? You or him? Right? Now, I understand that foolishness in the aftermath of reconstructive surgery uh, is not a good idea. But it's not much worse an idea than immediately beginning to use the structure that was repaired. Okay. I've had a lot of personal experience with this. Lots and lot more personal experience with it than I really want. But I have learned from personal experience over decades that what happens after an injury is you have to get back to the use of that structure as quickly as possible. And this may or may not coincide with your doctor's experience or his wishes. Now, I will go so far as to say that if a doctor has never had a shoulder reconstruction, has never had a rotator cuff repair himself personally, he doesn't know. Really, he doesn't really know what you can and can't do with a shoulder that it's been repaired. Now, he understands his repair better than you do, right? But you understand the way your shoulder feels and responds on a daily basis to the things you do to it than he does. And that is what is important, okay? It is very seldom correct to completely immobilize a repaired structure. Very, very seldom correct. There are some examples uh, of, of such things, but the, the vast majority of structures that were damaged are immediately better after the repair, aren't they? If you'll remember our conversation with Dr. Manji uh, and his discussion of cardiac rehab, this is, this is terribly germane to this situation. Your heart, after it is fixed by him, is way, way better than it was before the surgery, all right? And it is a mistake to not use it and further force a healthy adaptation to the stress. He's, he's sawed your chest open. He's retracted your sternum. He's taken your heart out in his hand. He's sewn on it and slapped it around and drained it of blood and frozen it and warmed it back up and done all kind of unspeakable horrors to your heart. Yet you want to sit around on your ass after this repair and listen to these people at cardiac rehab who want you to go up to a, a heart rate of about 100 beats per second during their little silly-ass rehab program that they, by the way, get paid for. And uh, just look at that episode. It, it, it visits the situation in detail. And uh, you take those principles and apply them everywhere else. If my knee is deranged, then when it's repaired, it's better than it was before. And I understand we have to let the repair heal. I understand that. Uh I understand that way better than you do, okay? Because I've had both my knees worked on. I understand about letting repairs heal. But what I do understand is that you force things to heal. 
you don't let them heal. Things don't heal if they don't have to. Any repair must be loaded, whether it's a fracture or a suture or anything else. There has to be some stress applied to the repair to tell the structure that it's damaged and that it needs to go ahead and remodel itself. And that remodeling is the result of the forces that you apply to the repair. This goes much faster. If you take a shattered femur and immobilize somebody in a bed for six weeks, guess what happens? <laughs> Nothing. If it heals at all, it's accidental. Okay? And the way you know this is the obvious example of fractured ribs. Fractured ribs are the quickest healing fractures in the human body. Uh, I'm familiar with the case uh, of a woman that was in an extremely bad car accident who had a flail chest on one side of her body, a complete flail chest, which means that all of the ribs are broken to the point where they lack the rigidity necessary to hold negative pressure against the lungs during respiration. It's a flail chest. It's a disaster. It's a fucking mess. All right? Or any broken rib. If you've ever had a broken rib, you remember very clearly how bad the damn thing hurt. You also remember that three weeks later, it was okay. Three weeks later, it was okay. And why is this? Think very carefully. Why does a broken rib heal so quickly? Because it cannot be immobilized. It's moving. The fracture line in the rib is moving the entire time. And the motion is the cell signaling mechanism that causes the osteoblasts around the fracture line to start laying down bone mineral. The movement is the signal for the healing. This is true everywhere. This is why total immobilization does not work because in a normal situation, stress that can be recovered from produces an adaptation. And in the case of a weight-bearing structure like a bone, stress is load. And this, is, this, this doesn't just apply to ribs. It applies to everything. And I don't understand why doctors are so reluctant to come to grips with this. If they've done a good repair, immobilization for six weeks is, it's not only impossible. Frankly, nobody does that. You know, you're going to take a shower, right? You're going to move your arm around in the shower. You're going to scratch your nose, you know. You're going you're gonna to move it around. And it may be that they know that. Uh, but they don't act like they know it. Uh, movement is necessary. And you'll never walk again. And six weeks from the surgery, I'm going to release you to movement, to some limited rehab. That kind of thing is just, you know... It's, it's, it's jerked out of his ass, but it's, you know, it's at some point it no longer becomes just suddenly jerked out of his ass. It, it'd get written down someplace and it's office procedure and it's in a little bad photocopy they give you when you leave the office. Absolute immobility for six weeks. And then we're going to release you to move like they own you. That, that's kind of offensive, you know. It's just kind of offensive. Uh, to me, maybe fine with you. Oh, how about the can't get stronger after the age of 50? You guys heard that? It's it, You can't get any stronger. If you're 50 years old, you're as strong as you're ever going to be because you can't get stronger. 
No, no, you can't get stronger. No, because the stress recovery adaptation cycle shuts down on your 50th birthday. Uh, yeah, biology stops functioning. Physiology is no longer uh, in operation after the age of 50. Right, so in other words, if you're 65 years old and you come to the gym and uh, and you say to me, uh, you know, I noticed that uh, I'm not as strong as I used to be and I think I'd like to get stronger. I have to say to you, I'm sorry, you're 65. You can't get any stronger. In other words, I can't find out how strong you are right now on say the bench press or leg press deadlift i can't i can't determine how strong you are right now and then go up five pounds next time i can't do that because you're 65 and it won't work it'll hurt them actually oh it'll yeah it it bends them over why you'll break something Mm -hmm. you know and uh you don't want to let some guy in a gym, you know, break you. You know, it's your fault because you ought to have enough sense to know that you're over the age of 50 and you can't get any stronger. The processes that make everybody else stronger a little bit at a time, the processes that accumulate into a strength adaptation, don't apply to you because you're 51. <laughs> Oh, forty nine is good. Forty nine, hey, <laughs> forty nine, you're fine. Get after it, you know, because you only got a year. You only got a year to get anything done, right? <laughs> oh shit! How about everybody ought to take statins? There are actually doctors who think statins should be in the water supply along with fluoride. You know, it's uh, it's amazing how good a job the uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies have done on these guys who have uh, um, come to the conclusion that everyone benefits from statins. Um we, we talked about this a lot. Steph and I have talked about this a lot. She's real familiar with the literature being uh, in the business she has been in for a long time and is uh, uh, familiar with this literature. There is one group of people, one demographic, one, for whom statins have been proven to be beneficial, and that is men over the age of 50 who have already had a heart attack. That's it. There is no female demographic for which statins have proven to be beneficial, and there's no other male demographic for which statins have proven to be beneficial. Yet, Pfizer has made, what, several hundred trillion dollars off of the statin market, it's the most widely prescribed drug on the planet. Lipitor, the most widely prescribed drug on the planet. And it is fascinating that, to me, that there's no evidence that it should be. Yet, doctors want you on statins. Ask them why. Well, because it lowers your serum cholesterol. Well, what does an elevated serum cholesterol do? Well, it gives you heart disease. Well, no, it doesn't. Certainly not in every case. I have a friend whose 19-year-old daughter showed up at the doctor's office one day with a total cholesterol of 205. And do you know they sent her home with a, with a Lipitor prescription? This is such clear 
medical malpractice that I, you know, but he didn't seem to think anything was wrong with that. And I, you know, man's fairly intelligent, but it was outside his specialty. Have you ever noticed that people with PhDs tend to respect the opinions of other people with PhDs without a lot of critical uh, inspection? Well, this was his situation. So statins are universally recommended by doctors for everybody. And uh, that's just pointless. It's, it's not only pointless, it's harmful because statins have lots and lots of side effects. And those of you who are taking them are more familiar with those than I am. And it's, it's not a good idea. You're treating a lab value, not a disease. That in itself should raise flags, shouldn't it? You walk in perfectly healthy with no symptoms of any kind of disease. And you show up with a total cholesterol of 230, and they send you home with a statin prescription? Don't let this be done to you just because a doctor told you to do it. There, there are, you have the internet, just like you have the same internet I do. Look it up. They attempted to do that with me. They tried to give you a statin? They tried to give me one. What was your cholesterol? I couldn't even tell you, honestly, because I didn't give a shit. It, it was some three digit number, yeah. and they just weren't interested. And then he told me. Ah, you should, didn't just take them. Take them the rest of your life. He you told know, me it's going to make protective. you. It's going to make you tired. It's going to make they're, your joints hurt. They're going to make your muscles sore. They're going to make. Said, I'm not it's going to make you tired. Going to make your joints hurt and your muscles sore. But you need to take them for the rest of your life anyway. <laughs> well. <laughs> at thirty-one. At thirty-one. At the age of thirty-one. Oh my God. Yeah. It, you know, you're not the only one that day that did that. <laughs> There's a doctor here in town that'll leave that'll that'll give you a a blood pressure medication if you in his office show up with 140 over 90 with well, a blood pressure medication. If you show up one time in his office with his incompetent nurse taking your blood pressure and it's 140 over 90. Well, you're obviously hypertensive. Here, fill this prescription. Take it the rest of your life. This is, I tell you the guy's name. But, you know, I'm not going to tell them the guy's name because they don't live here, so they don't have to deal with it. But, uh, yeah, happens all the time. And it's not just here. It happens all the time. Uh, on the basis of one visit, one lab value, one data point, they're going to give you a prescription that has side effects because all prescription drugs have side effects. All prescription drugs have effects, all right? Some of those effects are what we want the drug to do. But there are other things that the drug does that we don't want them to do that we put up with because of the effects we want from the drug. And on the basis of one data point, the guy writes a prescription. Because I think uh, part of that is is you're expected to leave with a prescription from the doctor's office. Because after all, he is a medical doctor. What's MD funny? medicine is important to this model. What's funny about my situation is a week later, a week later, I cleaned up my diet a little bit, went back to a different doctor. Got yeah. blood work done. Yeah. Said I was perfectly fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know. Two data points. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh I went to the I had some blood work done one time. I just wanted to see what would happen. And uh I've always had lower than two hundred total cholesterol. I went into the I had a pound of liver for for breakfast. I ate a pound of liver. I can do that. I like liver if it's good liver. I had a pound of liver <laughs> for, <laughs> at at about eleven o'clock in the morning. At about two o'clock, I had my blood drawn and uh, came back two o five. Total cholesterol, 205. 
and they and they wanted me to take statins. <laughs> oh shit! That is just so funny. It's just amazing to me. Oh, uh, and a lesser man would have listened to him, huh? Right. Two eggs a week, no more than two eggs a week, because you'll get cholesterol. <laughs> Eggs have cholesterol, and you don't want to get cholesterol. Because if you get cholesterol, you'll have a heart attack and die. Why, that cholesterol clogs your arteries. Artery clogging saturated fats. Remember how saturated fats were were uh, a, a structural poison? You know, for how many years were saturated fats a structural poison in all doctors? Uh, recommended against the ingestion of any saturated fat whatsoever. And then uh, find someone actually read the fucking Framingham study and, and decided that, well, you know, there isn't any evidence for that. And now butter's fine and coconut oil's fine and, you know. I mean, how do we... Uh, how do we fry our eggs? Well, in butter or bacon fat. Bacon grease, fried eggs, that's what you eat. You're making me hungry. Yeah, I know. I mean, for breakfast, you know, eight fried eggs. And the way you fry them, you know what you do? <clears throat> you put the butter in there. Uh, I really, I think I like butter better. You, you you put the butter in the, in the skillet, and then you, you, you cook four of these eggs at a time. And what you do is, is you get the pan kind of hot and you get the, the white kind of crispy and brown around the outside of the thing, right? And the white on top of the yolk will still be runny. So you flip it once and just set the yolk on top of that, set the white on top of the yolk and put it in the plate. And that way you've got all the, all the white cooked and the yellow still runny and you make eight eggs like that and you, and you eat them with salt and pepper. <laughs> oh, that's so good. But only two eggs a week, right? Oh, God. Well, that's my little list here. And we've, we've asked you to contribute to shit doctors say. And we've got some, some stuff that we've accumulated from uh, Speak Up, from our little Speak Up feed. And uh, I thought I'd read, uh, I thought I'd read some of these today just so that uh, everyone will know I'm not making all this shit up, okay? Uh, after my MI, my cardiac infarction, my cardiologist told me not to lift anything heavier than 25 pounds. Don't lift anything heavier than 25 pounds. Because that's what causes heart attacks, is lifting 26 pounds. When I told him I was flying home and had put on my carry-on in the overhead compartment, he said I could lift up to 55 pounds, but just once. <laughs> <clears throat> I told him I had to put my wife's bags in the overhead compartment, too. So he said, okay, but only two. <laughs> the, the logic is, is shit. Doctors say, right? You can't make that up. You no, know, no, you can't make this up. Uh, had doctors tell two of my football players that they were cleared, cleared, released for full participation in football, but not strength training. <laughs> it's okay to slam into each other on the field, but don't do slow, controlled, progressive <laughs> barbell training in the weight room because that, that, that'll kill you. That'll kill you. You're not cleared for that. You're not released for that. One athlete had off-season knee surgery, and the other has had some back problems. So they can play football. They can tackle and run and throw and jump and smash and slaughter and everything. 
but don't do squats. But don't They're get that knee stronger. Bad, bad for your knees. Don't get that knee stronger. Don't get that back stronger. Don't get that back. Don't load that back. Backs will explode. Backs explode every day. But a 300-pound lineman can just 300-pound lineman it. running into you, that's just fine. <laughs> oh, my God. They say the same thing about soccer, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you, you can play soccer. You can run into another kid on the field at a combined velocity of 20 miles an hour, and that's just fine, right? But deadlifts? No, no, no. No, you don't understand. Well, soccer players are a bunch of pussies anyways. Ah, generally speaking, it's true. All right. Doctor said I should take statins and stop using the Internet for information. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Because what might the Internet tell you about statins? Something different than he told you about statins, and we can't have that. Because, after all, he is a doctor. We ought to have a shirt. He says, well, no, no, it should say, and after all, he is a doctor. We need to find some clever way to work that into a shirt. We'll work on it. All right. Guy says, I had an orthopedic surgeon tell me the best thing for my knees would be to strengthen them. When I asked about squats with weights, he said, just make sure you never go below parallel. That's really bad for your knees. Because after all, your knees weren't designed to bend in a position that goes below parallel. You know, it doesn't matter what the knee angle is. It's just hips below parallel that's the criteria that we're interested in in terms of i don't understand how does he get off the pot how does he get off the toilet he builds it up to it's above parallel oh, okay. they make seats like that for old people you know yeah everybody wants to sit above parallel yeah that's what i was thinking too yeah i like that idea that's like you know everyone should have one everyone should be on statins and everyone should get a toilet seat that builds the seat up so that you're above parallel <laughs> when you get up because it's bad for your knees to go below parallel. All right. Injured my rotator cuff, helping a friend move. Pain wouldn't leave. This is when I was in college. Parents wanted me to go to the doctor to get it checked out. Oh, God. Doctor told me to stay far away from any weights. I needed resistance training. He, what he means is you, needed, you need resistance training. I asked what that meant. He said, resistance training is working your muscle against a resistance, like a band. I asked, is it weight lifting resistance training too? Doc said, no. That's how you re-injure it. Trust me, I'm a doctor. And... <laughs> These are just anecdotal reports. They're just anecdotal. They're not peer reviewed. <laughs> it's probably bullshit. Right? Three months after ACL reconstruction, my orthopedic surgeon was concerned. Three months later, my orthopedic surgeon was concerned that my quad muscle wasn't coming back. He accused me of not doing physical therapy. I said, Doc. PT sends you reports every two weeks. They have me in the gym lifting weights every other day. Surgeon said, lifting weights will not bring your muscle back. You need to do cardio. Tell me, are you jogging? I like the idea that his... I, I just, God damn it. This can't be... All right. In, in the exam room, there's a picture of the surgeon crossing the line... Uh, finish a line of a marathon. <laughs> of course there is. Of course. I love the idea that Obviously. his quad just disappeared. Uh, just disappeared. It just disappeared. <laughs> but lifting weights won't make it come back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You got to find what it on they, the treadmill. Do these, do these people know anything about what their job is? No. Doubt it. No. We'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, let's see here. His quad disappeared. <laughs> uh... 
had some minor meniscus surgery a few years ago at age 51. And after a uh, pre-op appointment, doctor's assistant, who are even smarter than doctors, told me, after surgery, you can start lifting again as soon as you want, but just do upper body stuff like lat pull downs and leg presses. <laughs> leg presses. Upper body stuff. I think the PAs are even smarter than the doctor. Ten days post-op, I squatted 315 for five. Next week, I went in to follow up with the doctor. He said, everything looks good. You're all ready to get back to it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, here's good advice from a doctor. You have the back of an 80-year-old. It's all downhill from here. Don't lift over 50 pounds. And get an office job with a stand-up desk. These people are in control of your life. They know what's best for you. I've got... I actually had a doctor tell me while in college wrestling after a knee scope in the late 80s when he was in his 20s that the inside of my knee looked like the muscle tone of an 18-year-old with the bones of a 50-year-old. I thought for sure he'd tell me to consider quitting wrestling, but I was really dreading hearing that the weights will destroy your joints speech. Instead, the doctor told me, I know you're almost done with your college career, so I'm hoping you don't pursue anything wrestling uh, or football related for a hobby. I mentioned that I love lifting weights, and he hoped, and I hope he doesn't expect me to stop that. And he said, oh, no, you need to keep lifting for as long as you live. Your muscles and strength level right now are pretty much holding your joints together. If you stop lifting, you're going to turn into a bitchy old arthritic man. I'll never forget that doctor appointment. I've never stopped lifting. He's one in a million. (laughs) Well, not really, John. (laughs) Oh, here's one. Keep your skin dry, but moisturize it, but not too much. (laughs) Oh, goddamn. Oh, you really shouldn't be squatting any more than 135 unless you're a power lifter. This is my Cairo when I told him, chiropractor, when I told him I can't get wait to get my squats back up into the 300s after my car accident. You don't need to be lifting more than 135. <laughs> One of my clients mentioned to his doctor that his back was sore, and his doctor told him not to do deadlifts or squats anymore and not to use his back until you get your back stronger. Oh, it's amazing. Here's a woman that says lifting heavy was probably the worst thing you could do after having a baby. Doctor told her that. Worst thing you can do after having a baby. Do you know how hard having a baby is on your body? And that once you've had a baby, you can't lift anything heavy anymore because of the damage done by the pregnancy. I wonder what kind of condition women who have had four or five kids are in. Do they ever heal up? I guess they can't. Because once you're hurt, you know, you're by having babies. Then you're hurt from now on. Guy says, my mom's doctor told her regarding her new exercise routine that if she sees any sort of change, like increased muscle tone, then she's lifting too much. Says that right here. I have no reason to doubt this guy. You know, I mean, that is crazy as that sounds. That's not as that's not beyond the possibility of a doctor having told her that. Uh, 
Doctor told my diabetic mother not to worry about giving up Mountain Dew because we just need to use more insulin. Yeah. Now, I've heard that on several occasions. I've heard doctors say, look, diabetes is not a problem, man. We've got insulin. That is insane. Well, they just, they're, choose one from column A, choose one from column B. I want to know what kind kind of of, deal. Resorts that these pharmaceutical companies are sending these doctors to to sell these fucking drugs. I don't know. It's a good question. Or, or, I I don't know. You know, I don't know. We'll, uh, that is an excellent question. Uh, Here's a woman that says, the doctor told her, you need to take statins to lower your cholesterol for probably the rest of your life. She was 15 when the doctor told her this. And once again, there are no female demographics that have shown any benefit whatsoever from the administration of statins and certainly not an adolescent girl. This is just absolutely amazing. It's absolutely amazing. In my early 20s, I had a lot of back pain, had a doctor diagnose the issue. She told me, it seems kind of (laughs) disky, disky, and that I would have lifelong back issues and would have to do her prescribed stretches three times a day for the rest of my life. She also told me I couldn't be seated more than 30 minutes without getting up to stretch, including in car rides, of course. None of that turned out to be true. I'm in my mid-40s with little to no back pain and do every activity I want, including deadlifts. All right? Wife was told she has osteoporosis and needs to do weight-bearing exercise to fight it. Good advice, right? When asked for specifics, he he replied, just walk more. (laughs) More than the several miles a week she already walks. Okay. Pediatrician asked my 14-year-old son if he lifts weights. He says, yes. She asks, how much? To give an answer with substance to her vague question, he says he squats 250. Pediatrician screeches, do you want your heart to explode? Subsequently, subsequent visits with a cardiologist verified that his heart had not and would not explode (laughs) and that B, he had an athlete's heart, often confused with potentially fatal congenital or disease-induced wall thickening, right? His heart was in excellent shape due to lifting and other physical activity. Long story, but he had to detrain to prove that to her, the pediatrician. Who is a weightlifting expert. Who is a weightlifting expert, apparently. Uh, it, it's been my experience that pediatricians are, if not the worst, among the worst in terms of medical specialties operating in the market right now. They are almost universally... God complex, inexperienced, undereducated fools impressed with their own analytic ability far in excess of the evidence. And uh, I just, you know, I, I've, I've heard so many scary ass things from a, from my favorite story pediatrician here in town is exceptionally bad told one of my kids one time oh it's been 20 years ago and and this kid is a he's a good kid good friend of mine still doctor big kid he was like at the age of 13 he was 5'8 you know 195 great big kid pediatrician told him and I still remember this like it was yesterday he said I, I, I said what did he 
what did she tell you? And and he said, she said that no, this is this is the male guy. And he said, uh, he said, I'd hate to see you jeopardize your career in athletics by lifting a bunch of weights. You know. Can't make it up. So the question that presents itself is, why? I'm asking you people watching this thing, you people listening here, why? If you know for sure that what these people are telling you is bullshit, and you don't have to be hyper-intelligent to understand that it's bullshit, it just... If something they tell you, uh, something they tell you goes against your own experience as a living human being, why would you pay attention to it? You know, if if you let somebody operate on your shoulder and you keep it completely immobile for six weeks, like they tell you to do, you don't move it at all. You do what you're told by the surgeon. And you don't move it at all. And then six weeks later, it's time to rehab the damn thing. And it won't move. This is your fault. You're not supposed to be that stupid. This happens a lot in shoulder situations. You know, it happens quite a bit. But whose fault is it? Does it make really any fundamental sense to you that you can't move your shoulder for six weeks? Especially considering the fact that you actually moved it, right? I mean, you didn't take it. You didn't fail to take a shower for six weeks, did you? You had your sling off. You were in the shower. You moved it around. It didn't kill you, right? But you were afraid to actually experiment with it and and gradually expand the range of motion, even two weeks post-op until you could swing it in bigger circles and then you you didn't experiment with picking it up, picking your hand up to wash your face. You know you did all that. So you know that what the guy told you was bullshit, but you did it anyway. Whose fault is it? Well, you know, some of the responsibility lies with you, doesn't it? But a, a large part of the responsibility lies with the fact that we choose to give doctors authority that they don't rightly possess. That's our fault, too. But they're happy to abuse that authority. Why do they do this? Why do they? What is the explanation? Why are doctors in a situation where they, uh, have all of this authority that we've ceded to them, and they abuse it so thoroughly. What is the problem with doctors? Well, I asked Dr. Bradford to give us a statement about this, and in her normal, frank way, she has given me the following thing. Now, I'm going to, this is, this is harsh, okay, but it's the truth for a huge majority of doctors. Not I, We have good friends that are doctors that aren't like this. But even those guys will admit that this is true for most doctors. Dr. Bradford says, most doctors are midwits, 115, 120 IQ. Above average, but not especially smart, and therefore quite defensive about it. They're selected by the process for conformity, getting grades, the ability to do assignments in regimented modern classrooms, and they are trained rigorously. And by that, she means not educated, but trained. So you have a person who thinks of themselves as intelligent who's gotten feedback from the system that they are smarter and better that is based on the ability to conform and give the correct answer. Not only that, but that they have to give an answer instead of saying, 
I don't know. Or that I need to research that and get back to you. They're trained to have an answer. The answer. The answer that you, therefore, need to follow. The monopoly on medicine was given to the profession by the government some time ago. They sold out for defined authority in the health care system. This made them even more a part of the system. The most dangerous part of that is that this combined the power of controlling other people, both patients and other sub- subdomain professionals in the health care system, with personalities trained to assume that they should be in control. How often does a doctor admit to being wrong, not knowing something? How often do they demand rather than suggest? How many times has a doctor told you what you should do as if they are in control of you? Rather than simply the consultant that they ought to be. How do they react when you point out a problem? For example, the nurse that took your blood pressure incorrectly. Or other information, such as a research article, or that your cost-benefit analysis weighs things differently. For example, you want the joint replaced, but they think it's fine for you to be crippled and in pain for several more years instead, or or you'd rather not start taking that drug based on one lab measurement. You know, that's a, that really is a, a, a serious thing here. Uh, and I think, you know, those of you that, that are intelligent enough to uh, go to the doctor and actually question the procedures that occur to you in the office have had this experience. You point out to the doctor that comes in finally to, see you about 45 minutes after your appointment was supposed to start that his uh, nurse took your blood pressure with a cuff that's too small and that your 145 over 98 might not be the correct blood pressure. Well, he's all offended. And he's not offended. He's not offended because you're insulting the competence of his nurse because he knows she's an idiot too. He's offended that you dare have an opinion about some aspect of what he is in charge of today. That's what it is, right? My experience, this is, this is Dr. Bradford continuing. My experience is that any questioning or disagreement is met with resentment and anger, even simply asking for more information is typically viewed as challenging their authority. Any perception of disrespect and you get backlash. They're more touchy about this than the police, and that's saying quite a bit. It's really a good thing that MDs can't pull you over. Oh, yeah, I, I, there is a, a PSA on the radio I hear all the time about how you're going to the doctor and how the, how the medical... The American Medical Association wants to assure you that you're supposed to ask questions in the doctor's office. And the doctor's talking to a girl, and uh, she says, do you have any questions? And the girl goes, mm, no. <laughs> uh, I've asked questions. I always ask questions on those rare occasions. I'm in a situation where I have to go to the doctor. They don't want you to ask questions. Try it. Try it and see what happens. Once again, this is not all of them. I've had good experiences with a lot of doctors, but I've had far more bad experiences with far more doctors. And they don't really, they're not interested in your questions because your questions get interpreted as undermining their authority. 
Here's a story from Steph. Again, at 15, I dislocated a knee with a high force landing on concrete. This is interpreted at the orthopedic office as the outside muscles being too strong. They proposed weakening the too strong muscles. (laughs) Note that muscle strength was not evaluated in any way. And other structures with a lateral release. After declining, and I've heard of this before. This is not, she didn't make this up. It's not the first time it's happened. After declining this option, I was told that I should never run or jump again. So, uh, the the reason I wanted to do this today is because this is a problem that we deal with all the time. Uh, in in our business, in the business of strength and conditioning, all of our coaches have got to deal with the aftermath of doctor visits with their patients and and with strength training clients. And the assumption coming in with the client is that the doctor is the authority because. They've been taught that the doctor's the authority. They don't know anything about the strength coach's background. And granted, there are lots of problems in strength and conditioning as well. I'm talking about competent coaches, the kind that we deal with and we educate and we produce. They, if, if you come in to the visit and you really think that the doctor is in control of your body and that you haven't been released to do anything. What I always recommend to our coaches is to get them out of the gym, get them out of the gym. Anything that goes wrong that would have gone wrong anyway, you're going to get the blame for Don't argue with them. Get them out of there. If a client comes into the visit, into the first appointment with you, with any kind of limitations that they feel have been imposed upon them by the doctor that just did the surgery or the consultation, don't argue with them. Don't argue. There's no point in it. There's absolutely no point in it. Uh, they can come back when, they, when, they, when they're released, when they retain their agency, and, uh, and we'll, we'll deal with them then. But there's not really any point in trying to fight this, this uh, perception of authority that the medical profession has taken great pains to cultivate in the general population. Uh, it it doesn't make any sense to try to to try to, to fix that because you can't do it. And we we tell all our people just leave. Just, there are other people to train. Okay other people to train so i hope this has been some some enlightening information for you uh i want you to to back this up and listen to to steph's analysis here again as to why this this problem exists it's systemic it's not going away ever it's not going to go away you cannot expect this cohort to let go of power and authority. Power and authority grows. It does not diminish by itself. So give this some thought next time you're at the doctor and the doctor tells you something stupid. Shit doctors say is just that. And it's your responsibility as the patient and the payer of the bill and the evaluator of your own situation to, to take on the task of evaluating what the person told you, just like you would from a plumber or an electrician or a car salesman. Not everything people say is true. And you have to be responsible enough for yourself to do the work. 
Thanks for joining us today on Starter Strength Radio. We'll see you next time.